Welcome to Inside the New York Times Book Review. I'm Pamela Paul. What is it that makes us who we are? Until the discovery of genetics, heredity was a complete mystery. Siddhartha Mukherjee joins us to talk about the gene and intimate history. The more I thought about disease, illness, um, the more I came back to that question of, of inheritance. What do we inherit? What do our families give to us? How much of it is genetic? How much of it is environmental? Jen Salai, my colleague here at the Book Review, will tell us about two new books about so-called good taste and why we like what we like. Our tastes change. They change over time. And also we ourselves might not be fully aware of what it is that we like until we're presented with a particular situation. Alexander Alter has literary news. And Greg Coles, Paul Sigel, and I get to talk about what we and other people are reading. Before the discovery of the gene, many of the world's great thinkers puzzled over the problem of heredity. Aristotle thought it might have something to do with blood. Darwin, also, knew his theory of evolution depended on something invisible, but something as yet undetected. In his new book, author Siddhartha Mukherjee looks at how the idea of the gene had to be invented before it could actually be discovered and then studied. His book is called The Gene, An Intimate History. Sid, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Let's start off with your last book, um, The Emperor of All Maladies, one of our best books of the year when it came out in 2010. Continues to sell, had a long afterlife. What was the aftermath of that book like? When I wrote Emperor, I didn't know what to think about, how to think about who would read that. I wanted everyone to read the book. I also thought that only my mother would read the book. Um, you know, it felt as if I was in this kind of limbo between um, between reaching out to a wider audience, but writing a 600-page book on cancer, its history, and its future. I mean, you could say to yourself, if you were in, in the right-minded frame of mind, that no one would ever read that book. But Obviously, it took on a life of its own and has continued to do so um, with the film with Ken Burns. It's just been unbelievable to watch people respond and read um, something that's that serious and and helpful. And how did you get from cancer to this book? So this book, uh, three strands uh, come together in this book. Uh, One strand is personal. The personal strand is that, you know, I, I was thinking a lot, as I, as I mentioned in the book, I was thinking a lot about illness in my family, mental illness in particular, schizophrenia, bipolar disease in my family. This was the elephant in my childhood uh, room. I was uh, always thinking about what that meant. Um, the more I thought about disease, illness, um, the more I came back to that question of, of inheritance. What do we inherit? What do our families give to us? How much of it is genetic? How much of it is environmental? Um, so that was one strand. Did this also have to do with b- being a father as well? And, sort of and it was about really, it? it was really brought fully home when my two daughters were born and thinking about the future. Um, you know, again, what do you pass on? What is likeness? The ancient question of what is likeness uh, was, was very much part of it. The, the second strand, um, and it comes up later in the book, was that at the same time in my lab, we were learning uh, techniques that we'd gotten from other scientists, um, very young techniques, three, four years old, to manipulate the human genome um, in a way that's become so facile. Um, we were making genetic changes in cells, in stem cells, in fact, in a way we couldn't do six or seven months ago. The technology was profound. I could go to a, a researcher in my lab and say, can you change that gene in that cell? And she or he would say, yes, I can. I, you know, I'll get back to you in two weeks or three weeks. That idea for a researcher is so powerful. Um, but of course, it opens up a whole hornet's nest of questions. And the third was, again, it, was, it, it came out of cancer. So I was also treating cancer patients. And I kept thinking to myself, you know, cancer is an abnormality of genes. Uh, it's a cell where genes are mutated. If that's the case, then what's normalcy? How mm-hmm. do, how, what, what makes a cell normal? How, what makes us, what keeps us normal? So in, in a way, this book also ticks that strand. So it's, it's like a prequel to the Emperor of All Maladies. I was going to ask you if it's uh-huh. a prequel because James Glick in his review yes, of the book. Yes, it is a very much a prequel. I mean, you know, you, you can only understand abnormalcy that, on the template of the normal. We know that historically, we know that the, the, the Cancer Genome Project was, was built on the shoulders of the Human Genome Project. It gets very little mention in the Emperor of All Maladies where the cancer, where cancer is the focus. 
but absolutely it's a prequel. It, it, it deals with issues that are reflected um, in their kind of doppelganger sense in, in Emperor. How is um, structuring this book and the process of writing it different from uh, Emperor of All Maladies? This was in some ways a harder book to write because it, it's a, the structure is a little inverted. In an Emperor, you have a lot of desire for getting out of the kind of the, the wormhole of cancer, and then you finally discover the science. In this book, it's, it's inverted. You have to go through some science first to understand the future. Mm-hmm. Um, but all of a sudden, when you arm yourself with, with, with all of that understanding, with that history, you can begin to discuss really complicated and important things like what does the word race mean? What does gender mean genetically? How much is identity genetic versus environmental? Um, you know, what does it mean? What does illness mean? So the structure was a little inverted on one hand, and, and that's, that's one piece. But perhaps just as importantly, this book is even more personal than Emperor. Um, it begins very much, it's very much in the, in the story of my family. It's very honest in parts. It was hard to write in parts. Um, Were you worried about that in terms of what would your family think about um, the book? And I worry about it still. Um, it's not over yet. <laughs> it's not over yet. Um, but I wanted to maintain that sense of honesty. Um, uh, my family, most of my family has read it now. It took some healing and some thinking to be able to get uh, beyond the uh, beyond the kind of the invasion of privacy. But they were and are very generous about it. Some of the family members you write about are living in India. They are, yeah. And culturally, I wonder, is the um, sort of acceptance and thinking around mental illness in a similar place as here, or is it... It's very, very different culturally, I think. Um, It's important to make that distinction and be respectful of it. On one hand, of course, it's also more hidden away, um, more stigmatized. But on the other hand, because family structures are are more cohesive um, and more important, um, still people live in multi-family homes in parts of India, um, they also create a web um, of support around uh, people with mental illness, or any any illness for that matter. It's a two-edged sword, um, or it's a two-way street, as it were. Uh, there's, a, there's a bit of both. It struck me um, in Emperor of Mal- All Maladies um, that the history of it, there was a long period in which people basically understood nothing about cancer. And then you have very rapid discovery and understanding and experimentation. And it seems a similar kind of trajectory with with the gene. Absolutely. I mean, and that's because the both of the books go into questions that we've sought to answer for a very long time. In Emperor, the question was very clear, what is cancer and how are we going to treat it in the future? In Gene, the question is, who are we? Um, how do we know? How do we know the code that makes us? Um, how do we know how to define ourselves with respect to that idea? Uh, how do we know what units of likeness are? Um, you know, these are questions that we've grappled with for centuries, and all of a sudden, you know, a monk in in Czechoslovakia or the Czech Republic uh, breaks that um, that egg, as it were, and finds um, a whole series, a cosmos inside it and that's the story that launches the gene. In both books you these are narrative nonfiction you yeah. sort of you you um, weave the science into a story and neither one of course has an ending. But, yes. So how did you figure out okay here I'm going to just draw the line it's going to it's going to end here even though obviously the research is ongoing. Well, I try to bring people up to the precipice of technology that is today. But what's important is, I mean, I say this in Emperor too, you know, it's not the content that's, uh, the content will change. We will know different things about cancer. We'll know different things about genetics. We'll know different things about ourselves and genes. But many of the forms will remain the same. And by that, I mean, you know, the desire to change things in, in our likeness, the desire to alleviate illness through science and technology, and most importantly, the history of eugenics that's in the book. I mean, that's not going to go away. That is permanent. I mean, that's an interesting difference, too, I think, between the two books in that when you think about the future of cancer research, it seems like it's all to the good. You know, it's we're all aiming to cure cancer. With the future of genetic research, there's a lot more ambiguity in there and things that frighten people with eugenics, with, uh, you know, this whole idea of designer genes, with, was that difficult to to... I mean, it was difficult territory to navigate because, you know, again, the the ending wasn't. You know, this is not a this is not a villain uh, meets hero book. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a we meet ourselves book, and obviously, we meet the parts of ourselves that are heroic and the parts of our, our, ourselves which are 
prone to become despicable. And we know that it's, it, this is a book in which you can reflect um, on what has happened in the past and what might happen in the future. It's a harder book for that reason to write, but in some ways it's an easier book to read because you have more familiarity with the questions. You, it's, it's, you, you understand the questions more viscerally. Um, you know, what does it mean? What would happen to me if I wanted to change myself or my identity through genetic means? It's a question that becomes very, very personal. I don't want to get too much into the detail of the substance of the book, um, but just to get at one key question, um, which is what is a gene? And at what point did we discover there is this thing, the gene? Well, the, f- the funny story is we, we discovered um, the gene. Uh, Mendel um, really discovered the idea that um, hereditary information is, is carried in discrete uh, pieces. Mm-hmm. He didn't know what it was. He didn't have any idea about DNA. All of this came later. But he figured out that this information is discrete. It's carried in packets like atoms. Uh, It can't be broken down. It doesn't blend. It doesn't go away. But it moves from one generation to the next in in this kind of packet form. Eventually, we scientists discovered that these these were actually carried in DNA for the most part, um, and that there's a genetic code, and that code works by uh, actualizing all that information. But that was really Mendel's main discovery. It's interesting that you talk about packets and packets of code, because I think when people are explaining the very basics of the Internet, they use those same exact well, and, and, you know, I, I use this analogy in the beginning of the book, is that, you, that, that the gene, the atom, and the byte are the three most dangerous ideas of, the, of, our, of our century. And they share this whole, this whole commonality, which is that they are all describe indivisible packets of information. And you can use that um, to control things. You can use the, the idea of the atom to understand what matter looks like, what matter is, and thereby control matter in a way that you couldn't if you didn't know that an atom existed. Another term that's, I think, very fraught and that people don't necessarily know what the meaning of it is, is epigenetics. Mm -hmm. What is epigenetics and, and why is it so controversial? So it's controversial mainly because people don't know what the meaning of the term is. And I think in some ways, lots of scientists, I think this is probably the most constructive thing they've said, for now, it's probably best to sort of let, let the term go away for a little bit um, rather than getting confused about it. The, the central idea is that epigenetics is an attempt to answer a question. So it's best to go back to the question. The question is the following. The question is epigenesis, which is how does an organism emerge out of an embryo? So just to, to state the problem very clearly, you have from the same cell, from the same genome, you made in your body um, a, a brain cell, a neuron in your brain, and you made a blood cell. They don't look like each other, and yet they have, for the most part, the same genome. How did it? How could the same genome give rise to two such different-looking cells? So the answer to that question is that even though the genome is the same, the way the genome's used in one cell versus the other cell um, is different. It's a little bit like saying, you know, if you have a master score in an orchestra, you know, one person could play that, or- that master score very fast mm-hmm. and get one kind of music out of it. You could take that same orchestra and put it in another context, take out some parts, someone would play some parts slowly, other parts very long, and you get a very different sounding piece. That's what the genome does. And so that allows us to state the question. We now know how that happens. It happens because there are um, proteins. They're tr- called transcription factors. They sort of conduct the, the, ma- the master score. They're the conductors of the genome, and they're different. There's a different conductor in your blood cell. There's a different conductor in your brain cell. And they begin to recruit other things, other marks, other proteins, and this cascade is ultimately, ultimately causes the difference between cells. Now, people have assigned the word epigenetics to different parts of this puzzle, mm-hmm. but really the question that we're trying to get at is, is that's the solution to the puzzle. It's a question that we're trying to solve, not words that we're trying to make up. Okay, very different question, but I think an equally challenging puzzle and a little bit more of a personal question, which is I, I have to know, how do you do it? Because you personally, you are an oncologist, you teach at Columbia, you have a clinical and research? I have both, yeah. Okay, and you wrote this book. Yeah. So just explain, how does that <laughs> well, work? I just... I. I took some time out. I focused on, you know, I see patients in a very limited capacity. I see them one day a week. Um, I took some time out and I concentrated on the book and I wrote mostly at night. I came back and I wrote every night. What um, time? Like, how did how did that work? I'm uh, very curious. <laughs> my prime hour begins at about 8 o'clock at night and goes into about 1 or 2 in the morning. And that's when I get the most work done. I have to tell you, the way these books got written, and this is goes into my own method, is that 
I think of them as uh, knitted stories mm -hmm. or a web of stories. And that really relaxes the burden. It's not like I'm trying to handle an epic topic and wrestle it down to the ground. But instead, if I can just knit story upon story, individual upon individual, piece upon piece together, the book will get done. And I keep telling myself over and over again that if I could just do that, the rest of it would fall into place. And it does. I mean, that's the power of storytelling. And is it going to be relaxing to go back to, like, full-time medicine for a while? Uh, immensely relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> the only person, perhaps, will be relaxed just to go back to being an oncologist. Yeah, well, I love doing it, and I, I, I enjoy doing it. And, you know, it's going to be a while before I write another book. All right. Siddhartha Mukherjee, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. The book, again, is The Gene, an intimate history reviewed on our cover this week by James Glick. Alexander Alters here now with some news from the publishing world. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, Pamela. What's new this week? Well, perhaps you've heard of the Audis. It's basically the Oscars for audiobook narrators and producers. Those awards were announced this week. Uh, it's a very exciting moment in the audiobook industry. Downloadable audio sales have surged, and they've been surging for the past few years. But in 2015, they were up almost 40 percent. That's insane. This is beyond, like, it's looking like what ebooks used to look like. Um, it's it's quite remarkable, and I think part of it is just widespread smartphone adoption and um, the fact that people like to multitask and the quality is going up, and there's more variety and more options. Publishers are doing many, many more audiobooks than they used to. I'm always amazed by people who can multitask task, though, while listening to an audio book. I know. It's impressive. I mean, I find... I can barely drive. Exactly. My mind wanders. So some of the winners are interesting. The audiobook of the year is The Girl on the Train by Paula Hawkins, her best-selling thriller. Let's hear a bit of that now. I feel exhausted this evening. I am sober, stone cold. Some days I feel so bad that I have to drink. Some days I feel so bad that I can't. Today, the thought of alcohol turns my stomach. But sobriety on the evening train is a challenge, particularly now in this heat. There are three narrators, because there's three sort of unreliable narrators in the book. The narrators are Claire Corbett, Louise Brayley, and India Fisher. That's so interesting, because that that choice about whether to have one narrator do yes. all three. Or that's, to... I, that's another kind of... Thing that we're seeing as a trend is just these multicast productions, which are expensive and highly produced, and sometimes there's sound effects. And uh, so I'll go through a few other winners. The uh, audio drama of the year was The Jungle Book, The Mowgli Stories, and this is another multicast production with Colin Salmon, Tim McInerney, Bernard Cribbins, Celia Emery, and others, Martin Shaw among them. Can we hear a sample of that? The wild yams are drying up. Disgusting. Most disgusting. <laughs> Watch that to me. Not much now, but later. You'll see later. Ah, you shouldn't be so fussy, Icky. Everyone knows you eat nothing but the very best and ripest. Huh. Then tell me, is there any more diving in the deep rock pool? Uh, actually, no. Aha. Uh -huh. You know, it's funny because I think that audiobook narration took off in a certain way, in the same way so much did starting with Harry Potter, because there were two great audiobook narrations. The Jim Dale one uh, for the U.S. version and then Stephen Fry for the U.K. one. And both of them are supposed to be amazing. And there are partisans of each one. And people listened to both of them. And um, it seemed like like those books brought attention to the idea of uh, the importance of narration. Of the performance. It's amazing. I remember when I was reporting an audiobook story a few years ago, I interviewed some audiobook fans. And there are people who will listen to whatever their favorite narrator is reading. Yes. it's That's how they choose the book. It doesn't matter if it's a mystery or a biography. They're not choosing by genre. They're going for the performance for their favorite narrator. And one so. of the most popular performers is George Guidal, who has been a guest on the podcast and, and was one of this year's winners. Which book did he win for? He won for Best Male Narrator. This is, again, like the Oscars. They have Best Female Narrator and Best Male Narrator. And he was reading Daniel Silva's thriller, The English Spy. All right. Well, let's be fair. Who is the Best Female Narrator? This year's Best Female Narrator is Catherine Kelgren. She was reading Wild Rover No More by L.A. Meyer. Any other names we might recognize among this year's winners? Yes. Uh, Michael Strahan won for... Best Business Personal Development audiobook, and that's for his own book, Wake Up Happy, which is about dreaming big, winning big, and transforming your life. 
little known fact about audiobooks for memoirs, which is that you don't always get to read your own memoir. It's um, true. That, You're up against professionals. Yeah. And, and people have to try out to do their own audio for right. a memoir. It's interesting. That would kind of be weird, I think, having someone else sort of retell your, your little life. childhood uh, in- incidents of your childhood. One other winner that I thought was an interesting one was Lock and Key by Joe Hill. Um, the the book is by Joe Hill. The audiobook is by is a multicast performance. I believe Stephen King might even have a, a cameo on there. That's Joe Hill's father. It's a thriller. It was a graphic novel, and this is a fully produced kind of almost like an old school radio drama. And that's another kind of new thing we're seeing with audiobooks. Let's listen to a clip of that here. Everything's still the same. I can't wait to do it. Welcome to Key House, kid. Hey, Uncle Dunk. Forgot how crazy this place is. Talk about lifestyles of the rich and the famous. <laughs> hey, was it weird to grow up in a house with a name? You have no idea. <laughs> so, uh, what now? And there was another big name winner. Yes, Jack Black won for his narration of R.L. Stein's The Little Shop of Monsters, and that's in the young listeners category. I think that's a great idea to have audiobooks for children. That's all I get to listen to <laughs> in, sure. our, in our car. All right. Thanks, Alexandra. Thanks for having me. Has anyone ever called you pretentious? Or, perhaps easier to admit, have you called someone else pretentious? And why is that so insulting? What does it mean to have good taste? Two new books address the question of why we like what we like. My colleague Jen Salai is here to talk about them. Hi, Jen. Thanks for having me, Pamela. The two books are You May Also Like, Taste in an Age of Endless Choice by Tom Vanderbilt and Pretentiousness, Why It Matters by Dan Fox. Now, you're the one who actually decided to pair these two books together. Why did you do that? Well, I mean, it just seemed to me that both of them were looking at a similar issue, but from very, very different perspectives. And so Vanderbilt's book uh, is really sort of a survey of what we know about taste, how we think about it, how different companies actually make money and have a business model that's based on trying to divine what people's tastes are. And Dan Fox's book is looking at taste from the perspective of how people individually not only see themselves, but also sort of compete with one another based on their own tastes and how the label of pretentiousness specifically gets thrown around in order to put other people down. They're also very different just in terms of like the scope and the format, right? Because pretentiousness is kind of, is it an essay or a polemic or a polemical essay? Or Yeah, I'd say probably polemical essay. Polemical book length essay is the best way to put it, maybe. If you were categorizing it in a way so that people could predict whether they would like it or not. Right, exactly. So if you like polemical essays, then you will probably like this book. Tom Vanderbilt, it's interesting, he wrote a book called Traffic, which seems like a very different kind of book. Sort of what is his background and where is he coming from? So he's a journalist and uh, he's written the book about traffic that you mentioned. And he also wrote a previous book before that about um, the sort of remnants of the atomic age in America. And in a way, this book fits in with his previous approaches to his subjects, which is to take on something that people you know, that sort of hums in the background, but that people don't necessarily know in any particularly deep way, like traffic, and then really go into it, report on stuff, talk to a lot of people. So in a way, there is something shared, even though the subject of taste, I would say, is very, very different from the subject of traffic. It feels like a very hard subject to tackle in a book, because there's so many ways you could go about it. What's his basic approach? Well, I think that this is actually one of the things when I was reading it that I was trying to figure out. And from the beginning, he says that one of the big questions that he's interested in is why do we like the things that we like, which seems like a simple question, but it's actually incredibly complicated. And I do give him a lot of credit for really trying to look at it from different angles. And so, you know, he visits uh, companies such as Netflix in order to see 
how people watch and how the company pays attention to what people watch. Because now with video streaming, it's really possible not just to see what people say they want to watch, but also to see, you know, did they stop Right. Five minutes into this, and Ingmar give it Bergman, five stars nonetheless. Right, right. Into this Ingmar Bergman film, and then end up watching something by Adam Sandler. Right. You know, one of the things that he is very interested in is how new technology has enabled these new businesses to spring up, and also existing businesses to really sort of better understand what it is that people really like. Because I think a lot of this stuff c- does come down to. You know, what is it that people say they like, but what is it that they really like? What does their behavior tell us? I kind of loved the Netflix example because um, my husband uh, is a longtime Netflix subscriber. And uh, one of the things that he loves doing is screwing around with the algorithm. So he'll purposefully give like five stars to things just to kind of see what it does with their their. Oh, yeah lineup um, yeah. and, and how they because sometimes I'll look at it and I'll be like why are they suggesting this to us and, <laughs> and it has to do with that uh, sort of prankster uh, oh, yeah. but um, the word taste even is hard to define I'm like what is taste versus a preference one of the early chapters of Vanderbilt's book what he focuses on is actual taste like physical taste and what we eat and what we consume because this is Something, you know, when we use the word taste, it's not only to talk about what we like in music or in books, it's also to talk about what we like to eat. And that's the more immediate thing. What sort of comes out, and I guess my definition of taste is something that I sort of get after reading these books, is just sort of a general overall, not just a specific preference, but sort of a constellation of preferences. And it's not necessarily set in stone. And that's another of the big points that Vanderbilt makes in his book, which is our tastes change. They change over time. And also we ourselves might not be fully aware of what it is that we like until we're presented with a particular situation where, you know, do we want to watch The Seventh Seal? In Vanderbilt's book, um, when he talks about taste, he talks about the importance of music and um, this whole idea of the hipster barista. Why is music so important, and what does he mean by the hipster barista? So one of the companies he visits in his journey is uh, the Echo Nest, which is a company that tries to figure out what people might like based on either their existing preferences or other things that they reveal about themselves. And so one of the things that the engineers or the founders tell him actually is that musical preference is really predictive of a lot of other things. And so he makes reference to this playful survey that the Echo Nest offered for people, which is, what's your stereotype? And I tried to find it online. Unfortunately, it was no longer available. So I could not find out if I, too, was a his- hipster barista. But he finds out that he fits under the category of hipster barista, which he finds totally reasonable, considering that he says that he spent a lot of time writing in Brooklyn coffee shops. And then there are all these these other issues around the idea of taste, like um, what is good taste, right? right? And what is tasteful, which is right. how you kind of open up the review, which I think brings us into the whole idea of, of pretentiousness and um, what these words sort of actually mean and, and what we what kind of meaning we give to them. I mean, he, the author Dan Fox of that book, has a very specific definition of pretentiousness. What does he say it means? Yes, for him, he first looks at the etymology of the word. So, you know, he looks at the Latin roots. So there's the part that's pri, which means before, and tendera, which means to stretch or extend. And so it's connected to this idea of pretending. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for him, the pretentious person is somebody who is willing to try out and experiment and try to get to know things that might not be immediately obvious or something that they might think they might immediately like, but Mm -hmm. just to sort of see what happens. And for him, this is why it's really connected to art, because it's something that involves trying something new, something really innovative that doesn't just sort of go back and feed our easy needs for like a certain kind of gratification. 
Okay, so the skeptical response to that kind of definition is, well, that's very nice for you to say, Dan Fox, that that's what pretentiousness means, pretending and pushing your your sort of your tastes uh, or experimentation to the to its limits. Um, but for the rest of us, pretentiousness means something else. Sure. And is does he what does he have to say about that meaning of it? Well, it's interesting, and I think that this is where it gets kind of tricky because he really wants to make a case for pretentiousness and redeem the term in a way. And so he does make a distinction between, say, pretentiousness and snobbery. And so for him, pretentiousness isn't necessarily connected to condescension, which is like another thing that comes up often in discussions of taste. Who is condescending to whom? Is it the pretentious person who's saying to everybody else, oh, look at me, I have such discerning taste and judgment and you don't know anything? Or is it, as Dan Fox would argue, you know, the person who is insulting the pretentious person. That, that that's, he's the more pretentious person, the insulter. Well, he's the more condescending person. Okay. He's the one who's saying, I'm more authentic and you're just liking this other stuff because you want to seem like you know more than everybody else. But really, I, the authentic person, knows more than the pretentious person. So he sees authentic sort of authenticity as being the opposite in a way in terms of value opposite of pretentiousness? Well, this is, you know, he he doesn't necessarily say that specifically because I think this also gets to the um, thorniness of the term authenticity itself, which is one of the things that he says, you know, and he connects it to his own personal experience growing up in a small town in England, is that the notion of sort of experimenting and being playful and trying things out and seeing what happens, you know, you can be authentically into that kind of thing, that that could actually be true to oneself. I think it's just what he's arguing against, from what I can tell, is this notion that being authentic means being sort of fixed in one sort of constellation of preferences, that you like what you like and you know what you like, and that's it. So, I mean, in a way, he's kind of equating pretension with experimentation or willingness to yes, challenge yes. your own tastes. Exactly. I think he and, and he calls it at one point the engine oil of culture. And I think for him that that's, you know, that's something really important to see it as something that really sort of opens things up rather than shuts things down. So um, he's clearly making an argument. Were you persuaded by his argument? For the most part, yes. I mean, I think the one thing that I I would have wanted to see a little bit more of, but his book is very short and very powerful and polemical, but what I would have wanted to see a little bit more of is sort of a real reckoning with the fact that there are people who we might consider pretentious in a way that's not authentic or that's used as a power play and that that is a reality. I mean, I think that, you know, he's very busy making the case for it. So it's understandable to me that he wouldn't necessarily try to go down that road. But it is an interesting question. I mean, I think all of us, you know, whether uh, we're reading book criticism or music criticism or film criticism or talking to other people about these things have met people for whom, yes, they will only watch a certain kind of film or only read a certain kind of book and are incredibly dismissive of other kinds of books or films. And so, you know, the sort of pretentiousness mixed with condescension and snobbery is real. It might not be the only thing that we should focus on, but it's something that exists. It's interesting that we um, we value authenticity oh, yeah. so much. And I don't know, and hey, I nothing wrong with authenticity. <laughs> I like it too. But I wonder how much of that is a reflection of sort of contemporary culture and and society and 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 it seems inextricably somehow linked as everything does to technology, this sort of huge focus on authenticity. And I don't want, I wonder if, I don't know if either author goes into this, but was there a time when it wasn't necessarily um, valued over this idea of pretension? Fox goes into this a little bit, um, you know, and he goes into the history of the theater. He also goes into the history of succession in, you know, monarchies where you have pretenders to the throne. I mean, there's, there's, there's a really complicated history when it comes to this notion of 
people being authentic and people pretending to something. And pretending to something hasn't necessarily always been seen as a bad thing. I mean, you know, one might argue that you know the whole notion of civilization is premised on a certain in a certain way on people trying to get along with each other no mm-hmm. matter what their own feelings are we're all faking it <laughs> right to some extent or another i mean one could argue right but it is interesting this notion of authenticity as being something that especially now you know if we really want to get into the political thing i mean one of the things that's often presented as a plus for certain candidates is that they're authentic and as a minus for other candidates is that they're totally not authentic. Right. Or that they're just like everyone else, that they're not right. snobs, that they're the common man. Right. And that's something that does feel very contemporary because, you know, 100 years ago, you would sure. want someone who was better than you, sure. not someone just like you. Sure. Yeah. So I think, you know, and all these things, and I think that this is one of the things that really interests me in the subject of taste is that I actually think it connects to things that are not just relegated to the realm of art or cultural consumption. They're connected to sort of larger questions of how we see ourselves and also how we present ourselves to the world and how we deal with other people. And what was the most interesting sort of nugget or thing you came across in reading the two books in that regard? One of the things that I I found really powerful about Fox's book is that he really opened up the conversation, I think, about a word that I usually think of in terms of a pejorative, but it really made me question my own assumptions. Pretentiousness, when used as an insult, is actually another form of condescension, I think, is something that was really, you know, it really sort of made me see things in in a a different way. And I I, I think that it's important. I think it's important just to sort of keep these different perspectives in mind. Well, I'm going to say then in the best spirit and in the kindest way that this was a very lovely, pretentious conversation. (laughs) So thank you, Jen. Thanks so much. Jen Salai is an editor at The Book Review. And this week she reviews two new books um, in our pages. You may also like Taste in an Age of Endless Choice by Tom Vanderbilt and Pretentiousness, Why It Matters by Dan Fox. So what are other people reading this week? To talk about this week's bestsellers and our editor's choices, the books we here at the Book Review thought were especially good, even if our reviewers didn't, my colleagues from the Book Review, Greg Coles and Pearl Sagal. Hi, guys. Hey, Pamela. Hi, Pamela. So what's new on the bestseller list this week? Oh, my God. There's uh, like basically half of each list is new. All right. Uh, but what's good that's new? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, on the fiction side, the, the most substantial new titles are books that we talked about last week. Um, Don DeLillo's new novel, Zero K, is new on the list at number 13. And Richard Russo's new one, uh, Everybody's Fool, is also new on the list this week at number eight. Now, are these guys regular bestsellers? Um, they are frequent bestsellers. Um Don DeLillo has hit the list. I I think this is maybe his fifth book uh, to hit the list um, after Libra and Underworld and Falling Man. And uh, his story collection, um, The Angel Esmeralda, was on the extended list for a week uh, down at near the bottom of that list. But it did hit the list um, on on the extended list. Yeah. So um, and Richard Russo, of course, um, going back at least to Nobody's Fool um, is frequently on the list. Yeah. And those books, of course, got very nice reviews in our pages. Not so the uh, biggest entry to the nonfiction list, um, which goes to show you uh, you don't have to get a great review in the book review to hit our bestseller list. That's true. Angela Duckworth's book, Grit, which is making the case for kind of uh, resilience as a psychological trait, um, is new at number two. It's, it's a book that has gotten some negative attention, but one imagines she will just grit her teeth and get through it. <laughs> right. No, no. <laughs> Pearl, I feel like I could see an essay by you on sort of a, the, the the virtues of the opposite of grit. Well, in, in fact, Pearl in fact, did an essay attacking the notion of resilience. I did, I did, and as a famously unresilient person. So. <laughs> no. What's the what's the is it flabby? What, what's the opposite of, of grit? <laughs> Just equable surrender. Okay, excellent. Uh, what else is new on nonfiction? Again, you know, about half the list in nonfiction is new, but down um, at the toward the bottom of the list, there are some interesting new titles. Uh, at number fifteen, the 
Historian and journalist Simon Sebag Montefiore uh, has written a biography of the Romanovs, the entire mm. Romanov clan, um, going back uh, four centuries or you know however long they ruled. Um, kind of looking at the history of the Sars. An interesting bunch they were. They certainly rivaled the Medici's in terms of gruesomeness and uh, extravagance. Um, and then at number fourteen, another biography. Um, this one of one individual, um, Philip Norman's biography of Paul McCartney. McCartney, just called Paul McCartney, uh, is new at number 14. All right. Never mind what other people are reading. Let's talk about what we like among our editor's choices. Pearl, anything jump out at you in particular? Well, I would say The Gene, um, which is on our cover by Siddhartha Mukherjee, reviewed by James Glick. I mean, and I think we've been talking about this in sort of show after show, the sort of art of narrative science writing. And it's it's just sort of like a very grand history of the gene as well, like, you know, intertwined with his own family's, you know, history of mental illness. Um, and Greg, what are you reading? After um, tearing through all of Elena Ferrante's Neapolitan Quartet um, at the beginning of this year, this morning on, on the train, as my train reading, I brought along her book, uh, The Days of Abandonment. Oh, I love that book. Mm. And I did not start it. <laughs> um, instead, you abandoned it. it instead, I uh, got completely immersed in this book that I'm reading for work, and it's complete beach fiction, a, a popcorn novel. And I, I think you've read it, Pamela. It's called Before the Fall by Noah Hawley, who, of course, is a TV writer and showrunner. He's the man behind Fargo on FX. It's about a plane that goes down, a private jet that goes down in the opening pages um, and with two survivors on board. Uh, one is kind of a struggling, um, recovering alcoholic uh, artist, a painter. And uh, the other is a four-year-old boy who is the son of a multimillionaire media tycoon. And the, the painter saves the four-year-old, um, swims like 20 miles to shore, should be hailed as a hero and instead um, starts being reviled um, on the news network that the media tycoon uh, ran. I'm completely yeah. sunk in it right now. And so well, you Ale- know, Elena Ferrante <laughs> is waiting. <laughs> I was <laughs> lighter say. for you too, you know? Like, and this is like, I, I always think like summer reading, people think about like popcorn stuff, but it's also a time I find when people read stuff that's uncharacteristic just because you have that time like... So there's no argument or book that I'm less interested in, in than like, oh, the glory days of New York or the glory days of Berlin or Calcutta. But I'm reading a book called Times Square Red, Times Square Blue. Have you read it? No. It's this obscure book that nobody reads. And it's about sort of Times Square and its sort of seamy heyday written by a guy who for 30 years, this was his name. Like where we work right now, this like land of like <laughs> Elmo's and, you know, sure. the shopping mall was was completely different. But it's where he came to sort of. There are still n- naked women. There are still some naked women. But. <laughs> You know, back in its heyday, like this guy would come for 30 years. He met, you know, his partners, his friends, and it's sort of this really beautiful, grimy, but like lovely vocation of what it sounds um, like this, something Luke Sant would have written. He w- exactly, exactly, and it's it's sort of it's sort of fun right now, and especially in the summer or the springtime, to watch this place fill with tourists to sort of remember it in a different. Um, in a different guise. Well, I could tell you about what's going on in Les Miserables, where <laughs> everyone <laughs> has arrived at the barricades. We've got Gavroche and Jean Valjean and Javert and Marius all there at this very moment. Um, but instead, I'll talk about the lighter or at least smaller book that I'm carrying on the train with me, um, which is a collection of essays um, by the critic uh, and novelist Tim Parks called Where I'm Reading From, The Changing World of Books. It came out late last year. And um, they're very short essays. Some of them probably previously appeared in either the London Review of Books or the New York Review of Books, um, but new to me, at least thus far. And what I like about it is I almost always disagree with him. Um, <laughs> or I frequently disagree with him. He's very contrarian. He he has this uh, essay uh, defending the e-book, um, which um, I am not a fan of, saying that uh, e-reading is the grown-up way to read. Um, and he has an essay sort of against uh, global literature and what the idea of global literature is doing to more local literature. And one interesting point that he made was about um, the trouble of translation, because he's also a translator. It's a great essay. And, oh, you've read this yeah, essay? Yeah. In his essay on um, global literature, he points out that some authors in their attempt to kind of be translatable 
will eliminate or reduce the number of wordplay, you know, the kind of wordplay that, that they use. Right. The complexity because complexity in the language. Right? Yeah, it's and I thought that's to... so incredibly yeah. sad. That's yeah. terrible. Um, and I hadn't thought of that. And then he also writes in an essay more specifically about translation, about how easy it is for translators to make mistakes. And he's got some great examples. And one of the uh, examples he gives is from D.H. Lawrence's Women in Love. The sentence that he cites in the original Lawrence is, quote, they both laughed looking at each other. In their hearts, they were frightened. And then he says, a recent Italian edition of the book offers something that translated back into English would give, quote, they both burst out laughing, looking at each other, but deep in their hearts, they were afraid. And it's just interesting, that insertion of the word but, um, which really changes the meaning um, and is entirely on the part of the translator. Um, so what it's doing is actually making me feel terrible that I'm reading Les Miserables in English and, <laughs> and making me feel that after I do this, I'm going to have to go back and read it in French. I'm going to have to learn Italian to go back and read Ferrante again. That's right. We're all going to just have to read everything in its original. All right, Paul, Greg, thanks so much. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, Pamela. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books. Our producer is Jocelyn Gonzalez, and you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. Thanks for listening. For The New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul.